as our keynote speaker to the African Women in the Media 2018 Conference. Please do give her a round of applause. Now, I know it's always a bit long to wait for the video to get the camera so the people we've talked to, so please do bear with us. I'm going to stand right by the laptop and then so I can communicate with you. Uh, but you're free to talk for as long as you need, and then we'll have an audience QA with child moderators. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So, over to you. Thank you so much for, first of all, inviting me. And of course, I have to apologize for not being able to be there in person. It just unfortunately didn't work out. Um, I also think I should probably point out that the amazing rows of awards behind me are actually of mine. Um, we have uh, Christiane Amonford to thank for the use of her office, and those are all her awards. So, just anybody has an idea. <laughs> Uh, so, the, one of the reasons that I really, really wanted to come and speak is because the public, this issue of visibility for women in, in the media, but also not just women in general, but African women in particular, is, is something that I have grappled with my entire career, uh, not just with regards to the, the obstacles, but also with regards to the kind of journalist I hope to be, or the kind of journalist I wanted to be. Um, and I, I thought that perhaps if I shared a little bit of the evolution of my thinking on this, and then we, we could open it up to some, question, uh, to some questions, then that would be helpful for you. When I started as a journalist, I started back home to Yan, and in a way, that was the best thing that happened to me, because it allowed me to understand what it meant to not have the luxury to get on a plane and leave. It allowed me to see and live with the consequences of my reporting, not just for me, but for the people that I was reporting on. And I arrived back home at a time of extraordinary hope and optimism. The, the North and South had just signed a peace deal that ended at that point, what had been Africa's longest running civil war in 21 years, and we all felt that this was the time to come home, to be a part of rebuilding, to be a part of whatever the future of our country was going to be in. At the time, the government uh, expressed very clearly that they were going to be opening up not just the political space, but also the space for freedom of expression and freedom of course and for journalism. And I couldn't think of a better place to be than back home, Sudan. And then that thought happened. And suddenly all of those spaces that we had hoped and dreamed of shrank. And all of those opportunities that we, we were going to have began to disappear. Sorry, Amici, am I, am I still coming through for you? Oh, okay. Um, I'll pick up. We're okay now? Okay. So I'll pick back up. Um, that before it happened, and I found myself as a Sudanese journalist with the ability to access the closed off areas suddenly in extraordinarily high demand for international media. That didn't mean that I, I got paid, didn't even really mean that I, I received the basics in terms of hostile environment training. We even the basics in terms of, uh, I mean, when I say the basics, I really need the basics. I was running around in, in the middle of this explosion of ethnic cleansing without even hostile environment training, without an armored vest, without help, without, without all of the things that now I cringe to think of, of some 22-year-old, to think of my younger sister covering something like that, but at the same time, for me, I, I wouldn't swap that experience for anything because I got to see firsthand what was happening in my own country. So as that for evolved and I continued to report on it and the space to report began to shrink, the government's patience with reporters showing the world what was happening inside Sudan's borders, especially reporters who could access into places that they, they could ban 
international journalists from coming into in, in the way that I could, their patience ran out. And um, as the threats began to mount up, my, my family asked me, not just for myself, but for, for my future, for, for what I wanted to be as a journalist. And that was, for me, the first time I really thought about what it meant to be an African journalist covering an African story. What did it mean to me to be telling my own story? And what would it mean to me to leave Sudan and to be part of the... I think you lost me again. Okay. Okay. What did it mean for me to leave Sudan and, and tell other stories? And what did that mean for the kind of journalists I wanted to be? And when I thought about it, I realized that actually I, I wanted to be an African woman telling other people's stories. Because that's one of the things that you don't often see. And that's one of the things that we, we aren't often given the place to be. I wanted to be standing outside of number 10 with the iconic black door behind me. I wanted people to see that we could tell our own stories, but we can also tell our people's stories. Because it, too often it feels like we are only ever given credit for telling our own stories. Whereas European or American journalists can tell every story. And for me, part of the journalist I wanted to be was to change, well, I say to change, I hope to be a part of the change of that perception. And that finally convinced me that maybe I could be of use outside of my own country, outside of my own borders. Um, I'm not sure that that was immediately something that other people saw as clearly as I saw it in term, with regards to when I was going for jobs or when I was pitching for stories. But, and maybe you disagree with me, maybe you feel that that the value in telling our own stories is so great that it, um, it, it, it arches over all of that. But for me, I just, I know that I, I have only ever wanted to be a journalist. And I didn't really know how to do that until I looked up one day and I saw Christiane Amonport on CNN and I saw a woman with a British accent and a funny sounding last name on the biggest channel in the world. And I thought, well, then maybe someone with my last name and a, a darker skin tone could aspire to do that if, if she has already broken that mold of what it means to be a woman on American television. Maybe that means that there is a space for me and I hope that by being visible and, can, and hopefully taking that forward a little bit that it allows someone else looking up and to think, well, maybe I could do this because there are still so, so few of us, and yet often even when we tell stories, when it came to the team that did the Libya slave auction, it had to, it had to be a team that could, could blend in, but, it, but it, that didn't change the fact that my producer was probably one of the most experienced journalists I've ever worked with, and yet you, would, you wouldn't imagine the number of times that people have said, well, in a way, it was easy for you. Let me, let me tell you, the last thing that story was was easy, but it was extraordinary to me that after all these years of the work that, that, that we had done together as a team, that there was still that little moment where people felt that somehow the fact that two women, two women of color had done this story somehow meant that it was a story that was easy to do because we were local in some way. And that just reiterated to me how important it is to not just do the stories that are close to home and make sure they're told properly, but also to keep again and again telling the stories that people find unexpected for me to tell, to stand there and talk about Brexit, to talk about terror in Europe, to talk about, you know, God forbid, and after a long life, when Queen Elizabeth finally passes on, I want to be at the front line of telling that story because a woman who looks like me isn't necessarily what you would imagine telling that story. So. I hope that for those who see me up there telling stories on CNN, that that inspires some of you to step outside of 
of telling our own stories and have the courage to tell other people's stories because at the end of the day, part of what we do is to remind people that what unites us, what makes us human, as storytellers, our responsibility is to make sure that everybody can see themselves in that story. And we have to be able to see ourselves as willing and capable and able to tell that stories, to be able to empathize with other people's stories. So you may see, I hope I didn't cut that too short, but I think probably, I hope there are a few questions out there. Yes, that was amazing. Can we all give a round of applause to Emma? Thank you for bearing with our poor intimate um, situation here. I suppose I could start with a question on what advice you would give both of us looking to break into international news. What advice would I give somebody who wants to break into international news. I would find what their edge is. I would find what they bring to the table. So for me, it was the fact that I'm an Arabic speaker and I uh, I was the only person who could get access to the post off areas of that. So it meant that news needed. Whereas the rest of the time, I think you're pitching, you're not really thinking about, okay, well, what do... What do I have? Because, you know, it's often, especially for us as women, we shy away from that. We shy away from thinking ourselves kind of, thinking of ourselves in big bulk terms. No, you are your biggest cheerleader. So I want you to sit down and think about, okay, what do I have that's special? What do I have that nobody else has? That's your edge. That's what people are going to want from you. And that's what you go out and you be. Thank you. Now, I'm curious to know, how it felt doing that undercover story in Libya. What was it like from the beginning of the process to the time we were actually there undercover? And the time we actually see it all come together. What was that journey like for you? The Libya story? Yes. So the Libya story was a, a really long process. It you know, it, it was it was years coming together. So I think almost when we were um, when we were getting there, we almost didn't believe it was happening. But um, what you didn't see on air, because it was very difficult to show while also maintaining the security for those people who are helping us, is that the contacts on the ground, and this is something I have tried to reiterate when people have spoken about Libya, is that the only reason we got access was because there were Libyans who were prepared to take that risk, to help us. So we were actually in a car with one of our contacts with his wife and daughters. He was so incredibly brave. And to get us to the location without raising suspicion, he you know, he put so much on the line. So I think I don't oh oh you can hear you can see Can you guys still hear me? Yes, yes, yes. You can hear you can see Okay, okay, cool. Sorry, it's just something went blip. Um so I think for both me and Raja, just getting there was difficult and extraordinary. And we were so conscious of how much everybody had put on the line to get, to get up there. But when it happened, I don't, I don't know that I was actually in the moment. And then suddenly I was, then suddenly I was in the moment. And it was so such a surreal thing to see that I was constantly trying to figure out how do we, how far can we push this? How do we get access to these people? So that's so when you saw the the auctioneer with the half closed door, that was because in my head I was thinking, I can't leave. I can't leave without attempting to to get to these people. I can't leave without. We can't leave without attempting to. Um, offer them some sort of help. Should I keep going? Is it just the picture that's going? Yeah, yeah, just keep going. Okay. Um, but also at the same time, of course, you have you have a responsibility to your team, to the people that were there with us, you know, what's the... How far can I go? How far, how far can I go and still be able to go to sleep at night? How far can I go and know that I did everything in the moment, not just to get the story, but did everything I could help those people. And the other thing that you didn't see on camera is because 
I felt that they were too traumatized to film is that we actually were able to get access to two of the people who were being auctioned off. But they were so traumatized that they wouldn't ask, you know, they wouldn't talk to us. And so we made the call, Raja and I, that they were too traumatized to give consent to, to be filmed. Because all we cared about was to ask them. At that moment, I don't think we even really cared about getting them on camera. We just cared about trying to, to get something from them that we could use to help them. You know, what are your names? Is there a phone number we can call? Can we, you know, we tried to give them food and they were so traumatized that they just, they weren't, they weren't responsive. And so we just, we didn't film them. We didn't use that. But I don't know if that answers your question, Yamisi, because I don't know whether I've actually processed. All right. Yeah, I've always wondered, you know, at, that, at the point where you do a story like that, you as Nema, as opposed to Nema from CNN, it kind of kicks in a little bit. At some point, there's that emotional connection with the humans there. And do you feel that you still need to separate yourself as journalists from the human feelings? Or do you think it's okay to actually intervene in the way that you suggested that you did? I think in that moment, you have to put the human first. I mean, we made the decision that we couldn't film those people. We couldn't. Because, because in that moment, that's actually being both a journalist and a human. Because one of the most important things we have, you know, it, it is our integrity. And I knew that person could not give consent. And so how could we have filmed without them giving consent? No story was worth that. I want to ask you, you know, when you came to Nigeria to do the police story, were you, were you afraid, were you scared to talk to those uh, to those men, that very last. Yes, was I scared when I came to Nigeria to do the trafficking story? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I am probably going to admit something that if my mother ever found out would make her very concerned. But when I'm in that mode, I don't really register whether I'm scared or not. Because I, at the moment, all I'm thinking is, how do we get in there? How do we do what we need to do? How do we make sure that the team is safe? How do, I, how do we make sure that we do the job that we're supposed to be doing? And then I think afterwards, maybe, maybe I think about, oh, but I also think that maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's self-preservation. I think I don't, I have been in, in, in situations that objectively I should have been scared. I was in, you know, I, I got caught in a Taliban ambush in Afghanistan, and I remember very consciously in the moment that I wasn't scared. And I wonder whether that part of that is because I, um, I have a lot of faith. I'm, I, I genuinely believe that either it's my day or it's not my day. And if it's not my day, then that probably isn't for me to worry about, you know. Either it's, this is the day that it all ends or it isn't. And if it isn't, then I should probably just put that out of my mind and keep going. But um, that was a good question. I will keep thinking about it, but I think the answer is in the moment, no. I wasn't, I, I don't think I registered that I was scared. Um, I'd like to know how, how, how you went into the camp where you got the Libyan prisoners. The prisoners, the slave trade was going on. How did you gain access into the place? And how easy or difficult was it for you? It, well, I mean, part of the story is actually that it was very easy to gain access to the place. I think for me, that was what made that story so shocking, how brazen they were. I mean, of course, when I say easy, it's easy in context, right? I mean, we still had to go to this, we, we still had to go on a journey that was pretty unsafe. We still had to go out to a community that, that meant that we were... Um, in the hands of, of our contacts, we had to put a lot of trust in them. But it was easy in the sense that it would have been easy for any passerby in that community to get into that place. And that was what was so heartbreaking about the story, is that they were incredibly, incredibly brazen. Um, and then your second story was, how did I, how did I, how did I, your second question was, how did I think about the story? How did you get access to the place? 
it's what access gets access into the carousel. Yes, so I think I asked it how I gained access. We um, we we went in with a with a contact who was able himself to gain contact. So we how it works in this just to give you a little bit more detail, as much detail as I can give without obviously endangering the people who helped us gain access. How it works is that when you have these people that you want to auction off, first and foremost you make phone calls because it's obviously safer to move people rather than set up the auctions. So you make phone calls when you have people that you want to auction off and see if you can just do the deal over the phone. You know, does the, uh, it was explained to us that people say, we have an excess of merchandise because they don't, go into, they don't go into details over the phone. Do you need anything? And then with it, so they make these phone calls within a circle of trust. And then someone will say, oh, I need a gardener, or I need somebody to work on a construction project. And then what is the people who are left, who are not moved, and again, I'm using the words that they're using in quotation marks because they're horrible dehumanizing words. But the people that are not moved in that first wave are then auctioned off. And the auctions are a little bit less safe for the people who are auctioning off because they then move outside of their immediate circle of trust. So then it is a friend tells another friend, and they tell another friend. And that is how our contact came to learn that these auctions were happening, and it was able to bring us along. Okay, so my question is, was there ever a moment where you doubted your career path? Where you doubted that this was the track you uh, wanted to be on? And after you came to the realization that this was the life you wanted to live, how did you manage to cope with the idea that money is not one of the, I guess, one of the attractions of journalism and broadcasting? You don't make a lot of money. So how did that, how did that realization come to you? And how did you cope with the idea of working knowing that maybe you might never, ever make a meet? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You doubt yourself all the time. And, you, you know, I just came back from maternity leave. I have an 18-month-old baby boy. I, you know, a million times a day when he, well, when he wakes up at 7 o'clock in the morning and I have to then go do a couple hours a day. Or when I, the first time I got on a plane, if I came back at 9 o'clock on maternity leave and I was in the middle of work and it was when Kyrgyzstan had their referendum and we were cut off from because the, the border posts got closed. And so I was there for two weeks. And it was the first time I had ever been away from him. For that, well, for that long, I'd only gone away for a day or two. I just, just thought, this is, this is too hard. I somebody had cut off my arm. But I also know that I don't know that I could be as happy and as fulfilled doing anything else. But that's me. I've been really, really lucky. I have, I have a very supportive husband. My sister and my mother and my brother and my father, all of them come together to try and make my life better. I, I had to go home to Sudan to tell the story of the student teenager who killed her husband. And I had to bring the baby with me for two weeks. And my sister-in-law and my brother and my father, because my mother was in the country, were taking turns to look after the baby. I, I don't know that I can tell another woman that you have to do this in the face of all your doubts. But at the same time, I also know that I believe when women like us, not just women, not just being part of an underrepresented segment in journalism such as women, but African women, what we bring to the table, the stories that we bring to the table are so valuable. I, I know 100% that every single one of you adds worth. I know this because I know that you tell stories that otherwise would go untold. And so if you persevere, I know that you would have an impact. But at the same time, I don't think anybody can tell you in the face of the financial difficulties and the personal struggles that you need to, that you need to continue no matter what. That is a decision that you can make. 
thank you. I do apologize. <laughs> we tried our best to um, you know, bring it here for Thomas in the town situation. Um, and I was still got the internet disruption. So hopefully what she did offer was uh, useful and uh, that you, you did find it 